Egg is going to talk to us about the key challenges of COVID from a head of department's perspective. Uh, unfortunately, at two o'clock, uh, I have to hand over to Sarah for a little bit of time uh, to, to continue, Chair. But hopefully, Greg will have a little bit of time before two o'clock uh, to have a few questions before we go into the breakout room. So if you're happy, Greg, away you go. I'm fine. So first thing is to try and share a screen and see if it works. Um, yep. <laughs> Is that sharing? Perfect. That's good. Oh, um, it looks like I've got um, auto auto um, transcription on as well, which is interesting. Oh, don't worry. I didn't didn't know I had that up, but anyway. Um, anyway, so um, so I'm trying to decide which screen to look at now. I've got too many screens. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to doing this live. I'm used to doing recordings and things, but don't tend to share screens live very much. With what I do, but. Um, and for, all right, so, so first, so I was asked to give a, a few um, um, observations really as head of the department. Technically I'm head of subject within a business school, but um, as you'll see, it's a pretty big subject group. So pretty much the same as a department head in most, in most, in most um, institutions, I think. So um, where am I going? Let's see if I can make sure I click on the right screen. Um, so this is a brief outline of what I'm doing. I hope you like all the pictures. They're all of Glasgow, apart from one, which is a jungle, which I took in, in, in uh, somewhere near Bogota. But anyway, so um, these are pictures of Glasgow. This is obviously the, the armadillo. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm going to talk about a few things. It's going to follow a bit of the similar pattern to Barbara's in some ways. I'm going to talk about some of the responses during these particular periods and probably then say, make some reflections and give some concluding thoughts towards the end. Um, so I suspect, um, well, a bit of context first, University of Glasgow, we're big, we're old, we reckon we're one of the best in the world. Um, and some of the stats say we are, probably some others don't, but of course we don't quote those. Um, the Adam Smith Business School, as I'm told I have to refer to, to ourselves as all the time, is it's part of the College of Social Science. It's a pretty big organisation. We are, of course, triple accredited. doesn't say that on here. On here, I probably get told off for not putting that on. Um, we're a very research intensive university and a very re research intensive business school. And that probably makes quite a big difference to some of the things that are happening here. Um, we're also kind of, I don't know how to say this without saying things which might sound a bit weird, but we're well embedded within the establishment, if you like. So um, employers like to take our students. Um, we tend to get good students and all that sort of stuff. We probably have a slightly odd profile of students, and this is even worse in the subject group than in the in the school, in that we have more a large proportion of postgraduate students and a very high number of PhD students. I think um, you'll see from these lists here, you know, four and a half thousand students, pretty much two and a half, 250 PhD students in the school, of whom a hundred are in accounting and finance. Um, and when you consider we've only got 50, 55 staff, that's a lot. Um, the three subject groups we keep being told are roughly equal, but it's roughly equal as long as it's okay that management are bigger. Um, they don't necessarily have any more students, but they do have more staff, it seems. That's one of the one of the jobs that I'm trying to work on is to try and get some level of greater equity on this. Um, it's taken a long time but it's kind of getting there. Um, our student numbers, as you can see, we've, our main student undergraduates are on the Bachelor of Accounting. Um, we take in about 100 to 150 a year. Only last year, I think we took in 180. Um, um, and we probably expect more this year, and I'll talk about that a bit later. We also have some other degrees with maths and stats. They have a... a some students on it, sort of 20, 30 per annum. Um, 
we have master students we have a lot we have normally have between 700 and 750 students um, they pay pretty high fees between 25 and 30 grand so it's you can tell that's about uh, 10 million uh, sorry 20 million pounds so uh, a large amount of income um, we have two accounting finance accounting phd uh, master's programs and three finance ones one of them those is ft ranked which we're pretty proud of um, I guess, um, and we do, as I say, have a large number of PhD students. So we're a big institution. We're very return research intensive. It's, I guess, what you'd expect from a Russell Group University. My roles, I'm obviously a professor of accounting. Um, I do a bit of teaching, but I, I'll be honest at the moment, I don't do very much, but I do do a little bit. I'll try and keep my hand in a bit. I'm head, I'm head of the accounting and finance subject group. Um, we don't have departments per se, but it's pretty much the same thing. At least it's all the same responsibilities, probably not so much freedom on budgets, but apart from that, it's pretty much. When I took over this role in, well, I was, I took it over by default in July 2019 because nobody else would do it. And the person who was doing it before just said, Greg's my alternate, he'll do it. Um, and then a few months later, I was actually persuaded to take it on because nobody else would take it on at all, which is typical, I think, in an institution like mine. Um, so I took it on for a three year period um, and I don't think I'm going to renew, um, which might tell you something about my experiences. Um, I appointed a leadership team, um, which was a relatively new idea. I have a deputy and I have two associates. Um, um, and I also take charge of the postgraduate programmes because I used to run those before and um, my two program leads and relatively new in that role well one's new and one's relatively junior um i'm also on the school exec um the school exec therefore is you know the body which reports up to college and up to the university um this may not be untypical in a business school it's got about 10 people on it it does vary a bit from time to time and of those 10 people i'm the only one from accounting and finance there's one or two people from economics and the rest are from management um, and this may be more to do with um, the willingness of accounting and finance people to volunteer for anything more than um, management being um, um, taking over the roles, perhaps. I'm not quite sure, but I do have some views, but I, I don't think I should air them here. Um, I'm also on various committees to do with particularly um, working groups, particularly to, to do with learning and teaching, because obviously my involvement in accounting education, etc. People know that that's what I do. So that's that's me. Um, I was, I've been doing the postgraduate um, program lead stuff for about five or six years. OK, um, so that's what I do. So the broad timeline is probably pretty similar to to, um, to Barbara's, although there are some differences, I think. Clearly, there was immediate crisis, university and direction. There was university direction, which was generally speaking reflected in the school and therefore in the subject group. But the university direction at the beginning was pretty um, weak, pretty useless. Um, like um, when, when was it? The 23rd of March, was it or something last year? Which was, I, I think, whatever the date was, it was the end of the ninth week of our 10 week teaching term. OK, so the immediate concern was finishing that that of 11 week technically teaching period. So it's the, the initial concern was about finishing the, the year. And then of course, the teaching bit was relatively easy because let's be honest, students kind of accepted anything at that time. Um, so what most of us did was go on Zoom and did, a, did our last lecture. Um, we had to do a few tutorials, some of which were assessed on the course that I was actually in charge of at that time. I was doing quite a lot of teaching that year, um, but not very much this year. Um, so we did have to do some assessment based tutorials and stuff and and that all worked reasonably well i think largely because students were kind of happy that we were completing the course rather than anything else and then of course the big issue of assessment comes up and the university's no detriment policy which was an absolute nightmare not just because the university couldn't decide what it was 
but also because it was so badly written that nobody could interpret what it meant anyway in the first instance. The other big concern was student numbers for the next year, the year which we've just been through. And you can see why that's important when you can see that in our, even in our subject group, we bring in 20 million quid. Clearly that's a massive subsidy towards the university's finances. Massive, okay. Um, and across the business school as a whole, we're only about a third of that. And nearly all of our income is postgraduate students, remember, in Scotland. We don't have undergraduate fees. So the undergraduates are paid for by quota from, from the Scottish um, Education, um, but Scottish Higher Education Board, okay, whatever it's called. Um, so student numbers was a big issue and the I mean, we went to a college meeting around this time, um, it was a, I think it was into April actually last year, and they produced some budgets based on university predictions of best case, worst case, likely case. The worst case was no overseas students. And in that circumstances, the university's budgets showed that the university could survive for a year. We did have reserves enough to survive for a year, but that was it. And the best, the best case was something like 50% of the numbers we were, we were expecting. And the most likely case was around a quarter, that sort of figure, I can't remember the exact numbers. But you can imagine what the graphs look like on the on the on the projections. Um, and this was, you know, based on university concerns. And of course, all sorts of things happened. One of the things that was evident, really, is that the university had no crisis plan. At least if it did, it was not evident to any any of us, even us on fairly high level. Um, you know, school executives and things, that there was much of one. There was no backup. Um, and one of the other things was it, which became evident during that first kind of few months was they kept switching between what was their most likely outcome and trying to plan for that. It's a bit like Barbara's um, suggestion, you know, that they, they switched two weeks before the beginning of the semester, but they kept seem to be changing a bit where they were going. And I'm, I am know that sounds really critical of central management, but I think that the underlying issue here is that, that they didn't know how to manage it and nor did we, and the communications were problematic. I'll talk about communications later. Local concerns for this were staff workload and staff workload and welfare in terms of finishing that year, because clearly there was a load of things that had to be done, in particular in relation to assessment. There was clearly an issue with technology skills and to some extent equipment. Um, I'll be honest, it kind of shocked me how how. I mean, I'm sit, I'm standing here. You know, I'm standing because I'm at a standing desk. Um, I'm standing here using my own personal computer, which is what I've always used at home. Um, I do have a university laptop, but it it doesn't have two screens. It doesn't have the memory. It isn't connect hardwired to the network, so it's really annoying to use. I was really surprised how little kit most academics had at home. Really surprised, if I'm honest. Um, so equipment was quite a big issue. Um, and the skills of using it was clearly, um, let's say, patchy. Um, but the biggest issue, really, from a workload and a um, and a student sort of issue, was this issue about um, assessment. We obviously had to switch, just like everybody's had to, to some form of online assessment. We had lots of conversations with about accreditation with different people. We got involved in the CDAF. Um, um, process which Joan kind of led. Um, internally, this was complicated by a load of wavering decisions on were we were we going to be allowed time limited exams or only twenty four hour exams? If they were time limited, would we be allowed to have them with a, a fixed start time? Um, and the the decisions from the university, like we were given, ex at one stage we were given exception, we were given 
exemption from the university policy, which was everything was 24 hour papers because of the accreditation requirements. And then they rescinded that. They said that we could have first year exams and second year exams, which nobody else in the university did because of accreditation. And then they rescinded that. Um, and then they changed their mind again and said, OK, we shouldn't have rescinded it. You can do them in August instead. So there was massive, you know, vacillation, I suppose, in, in what was happening here. There was some issues about staff buy in and skills into this is really in relation to the writing open book exams. Most of the staff were perfectly OK with the idea that writing an exam for open book was a little bit different from writing a time limited, tightly proctored exam. Some weren't. And this was a big issue at the time. And if I'm honest, continues to be a big issue. Um, because except for accredited exams, I suspect this is going to be the, the status quo from now on, because the university has realised it saved an awful lot of money and an awful lot of administrative resource by not having to hire halls, um, set halls aside, get the janitors to put tables out um, and all that stuff. Um, so I suspect this is not a short term issue. And the no detriment policies I mentioned before was very difficult to operate. Um, the main issue there was an, on, on the administrative side, and as I'll tell you later, show later, that was a big problem for many other reasons. The programme leads were very supportive about this, but um, there were some issues which are carried forward into the other periods too. And student uncertainty was pretty massive. It led to lots of questions and lots of concerns, lots of, I'm hesitant to use the word complaints because as soon as you call them complaints, there's an official complaints policy, but um, a lot of um, concerned comment, let's say, from, from students um, about what was happening and how unfair it all was and all that sort of stuff. And the other thing which I think is worth pointing out is that there was a lot of discussion about the likely time horizon for when this was, you know, were we going to be back on campus in September? Now, with hindsight, we all know how ridiculous some of these discussions were, but at the time, nobody knew. So there was really difficult situation. Um, one of our, one of the, the uh, deputy head of school actually was, who was a, a risk person in risk analysis and done some work with the health service and stuff and pandemics before, you know, was telling everybody there will be a second wave, there will be a third wave. This will not be over for two years at least. And there were other people, and I'm going to be honest, I was one of them who thought I was a bit more optimistic about the prospects of things. Um, obviously, I was wrong in this respect, but, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, I'm still relatively optimistic about it in some respects, at least compared with some of my colleagues. Um, the picture behind here, by the way, is the quads and the, and the cloisters, which are a really nice part of the university, the old building. Um, that's looking across... That's, just, that's taken from the side of the quad where my office is. But um, so planning for the next year and the big questions were, will we have students? And if we do, how the Dickens are we going to teach them? Because nobody really had any faint, faintest idea of which model we were going to use. Were we going to be on campus? Were we going to be on campus with social distancing, without social distancing? The university authorities went round labelling all the rooms as to the maximum capacity. There's still a lot of stuff on the doors with bits of blue tack. Um, I only know that. I've only, I've only been allowed back into the university buildings twice since March last year. That's how secure we are with our... How secure may be the wrong word. But anyway, that's how tight our control is of access to the buildings. In about April last year, there was a big announcement from the university which basically said learning and teaching is important, research isn't, isn't brackets, unless you're in medicine and you're doing research on COVID. We obviously have quite a big input, quite a big unit doing work on that stuff anyway. Um, and that's basically what it said. Um, it was all, of course, stressed up by in a, in a list of things which puts staff and student welfare first. Um, as you would. Um, and one of the big concerns, I think this is something that Barbara said too, one of the big concerns about staff welfare and staff health really was 
um, and our, our pessimist on the on the school exec was saying, you know, you'll be lucky if you don't have at any one time during this pandemic more than 20 to 40 percent of the staff off ill. So resilience is a really important issue. You can't allow any course to be being run by one person because that will almost indefinitely, almost definitely mean that a quarter or so of our courses will be disrupted. And I think that's a really important part to consider when we look at the, 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 what we tried to do in terms of um, where we went to go. OK, so. Um, and the university provided resources, lots of web based stuff, lots of other stuff, which wasn't really very useful, if I'm honest, and much of it was too late, too slow. There was a lot of tension between the public face and the internal plans, um, which caused me some ethical issues when we talked talk to students. And they said, are you going to be online? And we said, oh, we're planning to be blended. And you know full well that at one some stages during this period, we were not really planning to be very blended. Um, we were planning to be realistically to be online because we didn't, you know, later on in this period. So, so there's a big problem here, and a lot of that's, of course, to do with, uh, and that's where this apparent prevarication and uncertainty in universities' decisions arises. Because the university, I mean, we're a big university, um, we're big in the local economy. Us and Edinburgh and a few other universities were in constant contact with the government about. What are we going to do? Because not only are, are we big, in, big employers, our students bring massive amount of money into the local economy. Um, you know, really big numbers. Um, the university cut budgets, stopped staff recruitment, stopped capital spend. Um, that included stopping, stopping building our business school building, which is a relief because it was not right anyway. Um, and, and a load of other things. Um, there was a lot of, there was a it really late, just like in Barbara's case, um, really late commitment to no face to face. Um, and at the school level, we introduced a new plan, new resources, a lot of training, a lot of workshops and um, going for blended, massive amounts of support went into that. And then we had a new workload model and this was really critical to our management. We basically said in March and in April, the workload model is ceased. We're now writing up a new workload model for the next 15 months. In other words, your summer has gone. Your summer is learning and teaching prep. I don't care what you were planning on doing. That's what it was. Now, you might say this is callous management, but it is more a fact of recognition of the fact we were asking people to prepare stuff. And if we're asking people to prepare stuff, we can't say, carry on and do the other stuff you do in the summer which for many of our staff would have been research and of course we then had to follow that up with the with the implications of that lots of concerns about readiness engagement and resistance you'll see resistance and it, it comes in quite a lot here in my slides and that may sound really negative and it's it is a it's negative because it's one of the biggest issues that's affected me personally um new workload model teaching team so no course had a single person they all had effectively cover um, which is abnormal for our courses most of our courses are normally one person doing 20 lectures and gta's doing tutorials or the person doing tutorials number of students undergraduate we massively over recruited and you might think that's good but since they don't come with any fees it's it's actually not good um, we over recruited because we're at the top of the choices and there's massive grade inflation at school level. Um, so that's an issue, it's a problem. Postgraduate, there was massive uncertainty. Uh, there were lots of pressure from the university. The university was involved with the government and with the other Russell Group University business schools, principally, and some others. We decided to eventually to delay all of our postgraduate starts until January, which was a relief although it thought, well, that means the summer's ruined for some people, but um, because we were told that students wouldn't buy online courses. And then a few weeks later, we were under pressure to re-add our September cohort, not change back to September, 
but to run two cohorts at the same time. One starting in September, one in January. You can imagine how well that went down. Um, that meant teaching every course twice. Um, given that our, all our programmes have sort of intro courses first term, advanced courses second term, and then a dissertation based on the advanced courses, really, it didn't seem sensible to do anything, anything else, although some other parts of the business school decided to fudge it somewhat. Um, we were concerned about quality, particularly because we didn't want to lose our FT ranking and all that stuff. Um, most accountants bought into this, um, obviously concerned about the workload, uncertainty, technology. There was a minority who were very resistant. You can imagine that most of this resistance was around the, around the lines of, my main role is research. Why am I spending my summer on teaching? Um, or words to that effect. Um, some of the resistance, I think, actually, was just because they were scared of the technologies, if I'm to be blunt, but um, that's another issue. Um, local concerns, the school and the college tried to put in a monitoring system to see how ready courses were so that we weren't panicked. That completely failed. The technology wasn't good, cooperation wasn't good, and many academics said, it's, I'm a professional, I shouldn't be monitored, which I thought was rather ironic given the accounting profession are monitored all the time, but they don't think that's really appropriate, apparently, at least some of them. Um, so that was a big issue. So we had no idea how close we were to being ready come September. Um, we had a lot of policies and standards, and one of them was that nothing that's, that's accessible should be asynchronous. So all that's accessible should be asynchronous. None of that stuff should be synchronous. We shouldn't really have any synchronous content, um, or at least not very much. No lectures, no lecture, lecture length videos, active student centered approaches, low stakes assessment, in other words, in some people's ideas, you split the exam into four separate exams, which of course isn't low stakes, but you know, there's all sorts of misinterpretations of what that meant. Um, an idea of presence, every course had to have an academic presence. So it wasn't just something that was remote online um, and almost no course was finished up by the deadline. Um, finished enough by the deadline. I, some courses were still only about a week ahead at that level. And the plan was that every course should be at least 60% complete by the first, by the beginning of semester. Um, which was quite, quite interesting. Um, and of course, this crazy created a lot of problems for my program lead staff. Um, variable adoption, variable adherence to the issues, these points up here about the, the what's, what's appropriate. Um, and there was some pretty strong active resistance. I had some meetings where I was asked to interpret the university policy and when I interpreted it was told, um, somebody shouted, you're a dictator, why are you telling us to do this stuff? Um, seriously, I, um, I'll tell you, some of these meetings were, were pretty aggressive. Um, anyway, so delivering the year, obviously it's online student centered. This is where, the, where we hit an extra problem, professional services, our admin section. During this period, um, we had been running with a large number of temporary staff in our professional services. All of those were let go. That was about 25% of our professional services admin. And then they decided to restructure. Great time to restructure. The rationale was kind of, in, kind of right in the sense of, we've got less staff, we need to stream up, but it didn't work. You know, it's the wrong time to do it really. Um, and basically it meant that nobody, no academic knew who to contact um, and needed to contact three or four people before they ever got anything done. So how it was more efficient it's difficult to understand. Um, and more active monitoring of quality and all those sorts of things. And then two weeks into the semester, subject because of students saying, well, why are we online? What's, what, what, you know, what's happening? We gave up all of our uh, stuff and saying, you know, it's better to be blended, it's better to be asynchronous. 
and we got a dictate from the school to say you're going to have to do one synchronous session a week um, as a Q and A session to answer students' questions. And you can imagine what happened to those courses that weren't prepared. I think quite a lot of them ended up being lectures. Of course, we can't prove that because we're not allowed to monitor them at that level, but that's some of the things that happened in some of the courses. And in the end, our undergraduate numbers were up and our postgraduate numbers were massively up. So we had more undergraduate study students than others. Now, I understand that's very atypical for the universities across the world. Um, and certainly across the UK, and we're very lucky about that in the sense of our finances are good. Um, the university keeps changing assessment policies, frequent technical issues, the same sort of things that, that Barbara said. Um, investment in technology, but not enough. Anyway, local concerns, workload, parallel delivery, new unfamiliar staff, um, lots of staff very disconcerted by the lack of student contact and the lack of engagement. Lots of support issues, particularly with admin. Negotiation of resources, that was a big part of my job at this time was to try to get, because one of the things that they took out of our budget was all of our adjunct spend. Now you might think that's not very important, but we subcontract nearly all of our postgraduate dissertations to people from other institutions. So in other words, not only were we going to be teaching over the summer, we we're also going to be having to allocate all of those students to supervisors, to be supervised by members of staff. And basically what we eventually managed to do, well, not just me, but me and my colleagues, was we managed to negotiate through the school and the, and the college with the university to say, if we if you're going to make us do set two cohorts, we want that money back, provided our numbers are reasonable. And so we got it back. Massive problems with GTA, some of which is on the supply side, because the university don't like employing people are not within the UK. And quite a lot of our PhD students were abroad. And if they there's all sorts of tax implications and other issues, which the university realized at last. Um, student concerns you know where are they and all that stuff but um most of that was okay actually there were a few exceptions with um non-complaints um but most of them were okay uh, course quality appropriateness a lot of um variability i'm running a bit short of time here so i'm gonna go a bit quickly through some of these slides but um planning then for ne for the next year this year that's coming you know this is the key thing, the new policy on student centred learning, which was in the pipeline before COVID. But building on the COVID learning, the, 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 the word now is that the university is basically saying goodbye to lectures, which is ironic seen as one of the big publicity stunts the university is doing all over Twitter is advertising our new learning and teaching building. Um, which is basically large lecture theatres. But anyway, let's, let's not get around, let's not go into that issue. Um, so there's um, issues about um, moving away from traditional exams, what we talk, timetabling. We have now gone through three processes of timetabling. We normally try and type the university being so quick and agile. Um, time, ask us to ask for rooms for the teaching for next year in February, okay, because we're so good at our timetabling processes. He says slightly sarcastically. Um, you know, it's all done manually. There's no there's no systems involved in doing this across the university with, with uh, nearly 30,000 students. Um, and they asked us, well, just as if we were going back to face-to-face -to -face teaching, but socially distance. And you think, well, the university only has four rooms which will take over over 400 students so since some of our courses you know how are they going to fit it's not so um we've and we're now back to we then moved to program oh it's a mess uncertainty in uh, on university decisions continues the university continues to obfuscate and prevaricate what i mean by this is they're 
we're still wanting to not tell people that they, that it will be online. I don't think it will be online, but they're still very reticent to say that. Um, and at the school level, it's evolving, we're reacting, and we really don't know quite what we're doing. Um, one of the first things we have to bear in mind for next semester is we're still teaching in the first cohort, first semester of next year. It will be mainly dissertations, and we're still hoping that most of that will be done by adjuncts, but it still has to be dealt with. Um, some staff by, by this stage will be, by the end of next year, will have taught for five semesters continuously with no break of more than two weeks. That, for me, is a massive problem. I think that is a really serious issue. And of course, this is going to affect mainly the staff are on learning and teaching contracts, not those on research contracts, because they tend to have more teaching. We are continuing to recruit staff and we restarted again actually in December, like just gone, but it's not easy. I um, mean, we would have thought it'd been easy, but it's never easy. And that's largely because our criteria for staff are so high. You know, um, the criteria we have for a junior lecturer now is the same as we would have had for a professor four years ago. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, we have no idea what resources are going to be available to us, particularly space. Um, that's a timetabling issue in part. And this moving to the new student centre model is a problem um, because we don't know quite how it's going to work, how quickly. And we don't know how much we can return to research and scholarship and how can we do so fairly. For me, I must say it's not so much how much can we do, but how can we allocate this fairly when we've got some people teaching for five semesters on the trot and all those sorts of issues. So some quick reflections. Um, we've got about five minutes left for about 20 minutes worth of slides. But um, a wide range of pre pressures. Working from home is an issue. And one of the issues that's come up is working at home when home isn't in the UK because of all sorts of employment legislation issues which have become I think they've been there, if I'm honest, for, for years and years and years, but the university has suddenly realised it. Apocryphally, and I don't know if this is true, but we got a half a million pound bill for one member of staff that have been working in one country. Um, what with licensing fees, tax problems and all sorts of other issues. So it's really expensive for the university. So they've begun to realise it's an issue. All this stuff about you know, childcare and stuff. Actually, the last one on here, I think, is for many of my staff is a bigger issue. We have about um, about 10 percent of our staff who are junior members of staff from overseas who've got trapped in the UK and are not able to go back to see their families. And I think this is almost more disruptive than the people who've got children because they have no one really to deal with. Um, one of my junior colleagues has not seen her family um, and when you bear in mind that one of them one of her grandparents has died and another one is seriously in hospital for 18 months now you know and that's really hard i think lots of wide range of skills etc we know all those things difficulties in supporting managing people remotely it exacerbates the different difficulties Things flare up when you do stuff by email and that, you know how that kind of works. And I think one of the big issues that nobody's really able to deal with very well is this sort of bereavement of the jobs that we have lost. We have lost jobs because we're never going to get back to the same way that we were before. A large part of my job was travel. And I love the travel part and it made up for some of the hell that you, you suffer at other times um and that's gone and it's not going to come back in the next three or four years i don't think not at the same level um stress future there's a whole load of issues here with colleagues and being supportive is one of the most difficult issues it's not on here because i think it's kind of obvious but you know the the general problem about um you know helping people through these problems um, and dealing with career progression 
it was on one of the earlier slides, I think. Um, but we've changed, we've said that we will change our, um, our criteria. We have a criteria based promotion, not competitive. Um, but does anybody really believe that's going to happen? Um, the future return to the classroom. Some of my staff are excited about it. Some of them have, have said basically, if you make me come back to the classroom, I'm going to resign. I find this really difficult to deal with. My daughter's a teacher. She's back in, been back in the classrooms pretty much since Christmas on and off. And for the last few months, she's in a small room with up to 30 children, helping them learn art, having to try and teach the, you know, and you think, wow. And I know this is an unsympathetic side of me, like, but it's really difficult to cope with these conflicts, I think. Um, some of our staff really don't think it's appropriate for them to come back and they think they can refuse to. And I don't know how we're going to cope with that as an institution. Um, both in terms of should we be forcing them or should we not and all that stuff. And getting back to a wider set of priorities and picking that stuff up, I think is a really big issue. Learning and teaching. I mean, the bits in red are resistance. And we know about the variability, but the resistance has led to some pretty unpleasant situations. As from a head of department's perspective, some really unpleasant situations. Um, and that's probably, from my perspective, been the most difficult thing to deal with. Um, unpleasant and aggressive. Um, aggressive in many particular ways because many people see that learning and teaching isn't really what they in university for. Um, I have one member of staff who told me um, when he was asked to do some sort of tutorial kind of work, I'm a doctor, that's the work for GTAs, um, which I don't really think is true. And personally, I think the tutorials are much more fun than the lectures anyway, so I don't even understand why they take that view, but, um, a real lack of understanding of policy and perhaps more than anything, a lack of understanding of pedagogy. Um, I just don't think the staff are trained well enough, which is going back to Alan's point. Um, there's a lot of resistance to accepting help as well. And there's massive resistance to any monitoring. And I don't mean monitoring in a heavy way. It's just the, sort of the day to day monitoring you might expect. Um, and I have ideas as to why that might be, but of course they don't want to say what they are at this point. Um, and operationally, this new stuff is a problem. Oops, sorry, I've gone the wrong way now. Um, returning to balance is a really big issue. Um, and one of the biggest problems we've got is how do we, how do we recognize the contribution of those that have gone over the top and made the learning and teaching stuff work, not just for themselves, but for others? because our systems don't reward that. I'm just gonna be honest about that. Our systems reward primarily research. And if you're on a learning and teaching contract, it's not learning and teaching that matters only, it's also the learning, teaching and scholarship. And at higher level, scholarship really means published papers in pedagogy, which is pretty close to research. Well, I think it is research, but anyway. Um, so, how are we going to go? Will we stay ref dominance? Well, we may have a little bit of a relaxation for the next year or two, but this is going to come back to, to haunt us, one, is, one expects. Will there be a new normal or will we just try and revert back to what we always were? Um, and in many senses, what is this new, new normal and whom is it best? And how do you motivate and deal with those issues? Um, extreme uncertainty, we all know about this. Um, we just don't know what we just don't know where we are. I think one of the things that surprised me was the inability of the university or the school to think in terms of scenarios. So how do we plan for different scenarios? We just plan for what we think is the best guess at the moment, and then we keep changing what the best guess is, which I think is difficult. And I think it's largely due to the complexity of the beast rather than anything else. Um, and it's important that you think about how as a head of department, I've been trying to change things. 
and these are my pictures of a jungle it's really a coffee plantation actually not a jungle but um it's the best i had um where are we we don't really know communications are a massive problem perhaps i shouldn't but i've been feeling responsible at the beginning of this crisis i thought i don't want my junior staff to be laid off because that's what the university was kind of saying we're going to have to save cost i know in australia that it tends to be the people at the top of the tree have been laid off but we didn't know that at the time and i'd be very surprised if that happened here um because they're the people with the referated papers and they're the people who the university would probably strive to keep um it's a very complicated situation and one of the things that um kind of astonished me really was how unbusiness aware most of the business school staff were most of the business school staff did not really realize it seemed in their actions that if we don't get students we don't have money we can't employ you or some of you um communication's a big issue people 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 you know when i took over the head of department job i didn't expect to make any friends but i don't think i expected to create quite so many enemies either <laughs> um, um it's amazing i mean you've probably all done it i mean it's, it's difficult um anyway um it's not a great time to have done it anyway but a couple of con 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 concluding thoughts really I'm bound to have said we've done well because, um, and as somebody said in the past one, yeah, but we haven't really, have we? Oh, can I say that in public? Um, um, I think we have done pretty well. We've got good numbers of students we're doing, we've got reasonable satisfaction rates and things like that. Have we done well with our staff? Um, I'm not so sure. I think this isn't really gonna hit for another six to 12 months. I think that's when that's going to tell. And I think we probably haven't done as much as we should have done. Um, but to some extent, I do think we have to all be, I know it's stressful, I know it's awful, and I know there's something which is very difficult, but I think all of us who are here and all of our staff sh should have some sympathy for the lot of people who are much, much worse off in the pandemic than we are. I think that's something which some of us just have to remember. Life for the last 18 months has not been a bundle of, uh, you know, bundle of joy for anyone pretty much. So let's keep that in perspective, I think is important. But welfare is a big issue. Start, we were promising our staff that we would not hold their lack of publications against them in the career promotion stuff when we told them to spend all summer teaching. I just hope we're able to keep that promise. Um, I'm fighting hard to make sure we do, but I don't think it's a, it's a given. And it's certainly not a given in the wider market because if these people want to move, then perhaps other institutions are not gonna take the same view. I think as institutions, we should try and be, cooperate on that to some extent. Um, um, we have a very difficult future, but I, you know, I quite enjoy some of the politicking and the shape and the trying to shape stuff. Okay, my effects at my level is not as important as the at a dean's level that Barbara was able to do, but I think it's important that, that we as heads of subjects, heads of departments, should try and engage in that process and not just accept what the people from above say. We're the people close to the subject. We're the people close to our staff. We're the people close to the profession. We're the ones who know what the effects of losing accreditation are about. Because let's be honest, in our business school, the accounting accreditations are not that important. At least I don't think they are. The triple, the triple crown is important. That's what gets us our league table positions. Uh, so it's really important. And the other thing we have to think about is selling this new model to our students and staff and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean you know convincing them training them really um and i think we will survive but it's not going to be easy um i did have a tune on here at one stage but i think i took that off um and that's me in happier times um <laughs>
when I was more relaxed than I am these days. And that's Glasgow looking um, depressing. Um, but anyway, it's one of the university's official closing slides, so I have to use it. Um, anyway, I think that's me finished. And I've probably gone over slightly, but my clock's under this screen over, over here. So. Um, our thanks to, to Greg for a, um, a very enlightening uh, and, as somebody mentioned in the chat there, a very honest um, talk there, which uh, I say, I think the fact that you've been, uh, you've voiced it, I think that a lot of us are feeling it a lot of the same that you are. Perhaps some of us have maybe not uh, faced some of the resistance issues that you, you have because of the different institutions that we work in. And that might be something that would be interesting to take forward into the uh, into the breakout rooms is to, to see whether... Um, that has been a, a theme across some of the department, the other um, uh, universities and departments. And that may be a, uh, a nate, just from the nature of the institution that you're in, uh, which might be slightly different. Uh, no, I, I, think would, I would like to say the resistance is a minority, but it's a, it's a big enough min minority to cause, and everybody tells you that 20% of the people cause 80% of the problem. Only in this particular case, it's probably 20% of people or less creating 99% of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and, and I've, been, I've, I've written down, you know, from both of the uh, the talks that we, uh, yourself and uh, Barb, you know, I've put staff as the, as the key thing that we've done a lot of focus on students, uh, but I, and we keep saying about staff and we talked, uh, I think Barbara mentioned the, the quiet Fridays or quiet whatever day of the week, so we don't have meetings, but I honestly don't think we are uh, doing enough for our staff. So that might be something that um, is a theme that goes into the, the breakout room. So I'm hoping Shay can, uh, will sort, will have sorted out our breakout rooms because we're going to go into breakout rooms and, and based on the key challenges that both uh, Barbara and, uh, um, and Greg have outlined in their talks. Um, I thought if we could have 15 minutes just discussing that and then we'll come back. So again, the same sort of thing, if somebody would like to be a, a spokesperson for the group and just uh, when we come back into the main room, uh, if they could uh, um, share the, the, the key themes and thoughts from their, their session. So I'm hoping Shay can um, sort us out in a moment or two.